from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kenneth Nirati. I'm a reference specialist in the library's European division. And on behalf of the European division and our chief, uh, Grant Harris, I'd like to welcome you to the Library of Congress. Uh, the Euro European division is one of four area studies divisions in the library and is responsible for recommending materials uh, and reference for most of the countries of Europe except Great Britain and Ireland, Spain and Portugal, and European part of Turkey, which is covered by other divisions. Um, highlighted today is the Russian collection, uh, which numbers some 1.6 million items, whether in Russian or about Russia. Our speaker today has made very good use of our rich Russian collections. Uh, Judge Stephen Williams practiced law in New York City uh, at the firm of Debevoys Plimpton, and as an assistant U.S. attorney, and then taught law at the University of Colorado Law School from 1969 to 1986, with visiting years at UCLA, Southern Methodist University, and the University of Chicago, where he was also a fellow in law and economics. He was appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for D.C. Circuit in 1986. Besides his current book, he is also the author of Liberal Reform in an Illiberal Regime, The Creation of Private Property in Russia, 1906 to 1915, published by Hoover Institution Press in 2006. Today he will be speaking about his current book, a biography of Vasily Maklakov, uh, The Reformer, How One Liberal Fought to Preempt the Russian Revolution, published by Encounter Books in 2017 available at fine bookstores everywhere. Um, I am pleased and honored to introduce, you, introduce to you Judge Williams. Uh, well, first I want to thank uh, both Ken and the Library of Congress. Uh, I think it's true as to both of them. Without them, uh, I couldn't have written the book, possibly. The, the Library of Congress has a fine collection of the Duma records, which were the principal thing that I used here. But the Duma records are obscurely arranged in the sense that the spines do not clearly indicate what is inside the spines. So that very often I would find myself groping for what it was that I wanted. And Ken very often came to the rescue and uh, managed to fish out from the shelves what I needed. So I'm, I'm extremely grateful personally to him and also to the Library of Congress and also to Peter Rudick, whom I can see there, although since the Klieg light is in my eyes, I can't see him very well. But, uh, excuse me? It's not loud enough. It's not loud enough. I was, I was concerned with that. Now? The silver one is the speaker. What's this here for? This is for the... Okay. This one has a green light. Okay, but this one counts? That one counts. Can we turn this turn the volume? Can you hear? Say something again. <laughs> Say something again. Can you turn this one? Can you hear? Can, can you test it? Can you test it? Yes, yes. You hear? That's good? Okay. Okay. So, at any rate, I, I am uh, very grateful to them and both the uh, institution of the Library of Congress uh, for making my research and obviously many other people's research possible. Uh, today I, I, want to, I want to do three things. One is to uh, talk of Maklakov himself personally, so you, you develop, uh, I hope, some appreciation for him, which working on him for 10 years, I did. I, I came to feel he was a friend. And uh, the second thing is to look at the problems that anyone trying to promote the rule of, uh, of law in Russia in the critical period, 1905 to 1970, critical for me, critical for Maklakov, because that was when he was most active in it, um, to promote the rule of law, the, the obstacles that they faced. Uh, and finally, I want to close with a note on uh, just a particular snippet of a debate 
that he had where his primary adversary was Alexander Kerensky, uh, because I think it, it shows a kind of elegant way uh, in which a speaker in an adversarial relationship uh, can deal uh, with a demagogic bully, if I may use that term. So first, uh, Maklakov, it is, it is harder to see here than I thought. <laughs> I may hold my notes uh, to get them closer to me. He's, he's born in 1869, and his father combined sort of three capacities in his work. He was a scientist, uh, an ophthalmologist who published research in ophthalmology. He was also a clinical physician, and in addition, he was a manager. <coughs> somewhat indirectly, because he, he worked at the Moscow Eye Clinic, which uh, still exists and is still an eye clinic. It's in a handsome building in Moscow. Uh, and there were, in what appears to have been a quite typical czarist arrangement, three layers of management above, above him. But the actual holders of those positions did not do any management. They were there because they uh, were aristocrats and they needed to be taken care of, uh, so they were given positions uh, in the hierarchy of the institution, leaving the actual work of management to people below that level, uh, including Alexei Maklakov, uh, my man's father. Um, his mother, his mother was very well educated, uh, spoke four languages, uh, and she was very religious. And I, I emphasize the religion because uh, first place, Maklakov writing about her emphasizes it. And the second place, it's, it's reasonably clear that in uh, Russia of that era, if you're a highly educated intellectual person, uh, religiosity is not the first thing that comes to mind. So that the, the Maklakov household uh, brought together two different intellectual strains in what appears to have been harmony and love, and I think helps set the threshold for Maklakov as someone who can deal with people who disagree on very fundamental issues uh, in, a, in as harmonious a way as people who disagree on fundamental issues can. Um, incidentally, his mother died shortly before he became 12. Uh, in due course, his father remarried. Uh, his stepmother, um, there's not, there's not the, as you would expect, there's not the, quite the devotion to her as there was to his mother. Uh, but I think she, Maklakov's father was already uh, very well connected both intellectually and politically. And I think the, his, the stepmother, Alexei Maklakov's second wife, uh, brought him in touch with more and more of the intellectual elite. So. These were uh, uh, around all the time of Maklakov's later youth. Um, his time at the university, uh, first, uh, at, at the university, his reputation for eloquence was established. There, had been a, there was a famine in 1891, and uh, there was a practice in the university of a student orchestra having a concert, the proceeds of which were normally given to, uh, to help impoverished students at the university get along. But at the time of this famine, the idea came forward that it would be good to devote the proceeds that year to famine relief. But not everyone agreed. There was a large meeting in a, in a large hall with students. There was Students gathered on one side of the room advocating uh, the traditional treatment of the proceeds, on the other side of the room advocating famine relief. They sort of proceeded alternate sides. And then Maklakov spoke on the side of famine relief, at which point the, the line for using it for the traditional purpose faded away, and the decision was made to give it to to devote it to famine relief. Um, he, uh, 
he was at risk in the university of becoming a perpetual student. He had three majors, a couple of years at natural, in natural sciences, then a long period, I think four, maybe even five years in history. Uh, and finally, he turned to law, uh, and he got his law degree in less than a year. Why did he leave history? I, th I think natural science wasn't really that good a fit. But why did he leave history uh, in which he was doing extremely well? Well, uh, he had a tendency to get into scrapes. And uh, actually, this had happened when he was at the gymnasium. Uh, but they were less consequential. Uh, it was more consequential at the university level. What were these scrapes? They were, their involvement in demonstrations, uh, none of which, as far as I can make out, involved any violence. But it is also true that Maklakov's approach, at least sometimes in these demonstrations, was distinctly in your face. So there's a period, a, a point in one of them at which some authority figure is trying to get the students to clear out of a space. And Maklakov says, we won't disperse till you clear out the police. <laughs> that did not go over well. The person uh, representing authority said, grab him. And, and he was grabbed. Uh, and so that brought that episode to an end. Partly as a result of this and similar episodes, a guy named Bogolepov who was a high-ranking character in the uh, university and later actually became Minister of Education, was heard to say, so long as I am at this university, Maklakov will not become a professor. So that was naturally daunting to uh, Maklakov in terms of thinking of his career, even though he was very strongly supported by the most distinguished history professor, Paul Vinogradov, who later went to Oxford. Uh, and in fact, Vinogradov tried to talk him out of being dissuaded by uh, this remark of Bogolepov. But Maklakov wisely, I think, and probably for other reasons, uh, switched out of uh, history into law. Besides this remark of Bogolepov, which uh, obviously put a chill on his history career, he received for these activities something called a Wolf's Passport which was not actually a passport to anything except possibly oblivion. Uh, it, it, it meant essentially you were barred from the university until this passport should be revoked uh, and there was no particular procedure for getting it revoked. So it, it was uh, the end of an intellectual career really, or at least potentially it was. Now I mentioned that Maklakov's father was very well connected and he was and he managed to get this reversed. But it, it did mean that uh, there was a period when Maklakov was at risk of essentially having his career blighted for what in the long run of things seems no good reason at all. Um, at this point, I want to introduce uh, my Maklakov's brother. My Maklakov is Vasily, uh, the, the brother who's interesting and important is Nikolai. They have the same family background, and Nikolai turns out in many respects to be the virtual opposite. <clears throat> at, at this period when my Maklakov is at every stage resisting government arbitrariness, his brother Nikolai is staging government arbitrariness. And the, the most uh, <laughs> Uh, sort of intense development of this is the Bayless trial. The Bayless trial, sometimes called uh, Russia's, Russia's Dreyfus trial, involved a Jew who had the unfortunate uh, fact of being Jewish and being located in the vague general vicinity of a place uh, where the corpse of a child who'd been brutally murdered was found. And the other thing that was hard luck for Bayless was that some anti-Semites in the area had the bright idea that this was an occasion this should be used to have a trial for blood libel, an accusation that uh, Bayless, first that Bayless had done this, and that it was all part of a Jewish project to produce blood for somewhat mysterious Jewish rituals. So this, this trial proceeded, stage managed by Nikolai Maklakov with 
uh, Vasily Maklikov. I think it's fair to say the lead defense attorney. I do, I do want to quote uh, the remark of a juror who was questioned by a reporter after the case. Karabchevsky, we didn't understand. Grusenberg, we didn't trust. Maklikov, he hit the nail on the head. So it's, it sounds as if his, his uh, argument was quite pivotal in the acquittal of, of Bayless. So uh, Nikolai, meanwhile, was not only generally stage manning the, managing this, but doing extremely fishy things, of which the, the clearest example is eavesdropping on the jury. Uh, although as someone pointed out, it must have been sort of depressing because people on the jury kept remarking, there doesn't seem to be any relevant evidence which was true. <laughs> it wasn't. Um, so the question is, why, why are these two brothers brought up in the same household so different? And my theory, entirely speculative, uh, is that Vasily Maklikov was often and seriously the target of regime arbitrariness. And he responded to that, as almost anyone might, with a deep hostility to that sort of thing and a determination to fight it. Of course, he fought it on behalf of other people. Um, while, so far as appears, Nikolai had no such experience. So if you have a rebellious child, take consolation. You may be, may be breeding a great champion of the rule of law. Uh, the, a word about his friends. I want to leave time for other important things. The, the most important one there really is Tolstoy. He first to saw Tolstoy quite by accident when he was sent because of a, an epidemic, not an epidemic, that overstates it, a rash of diphtheria into the house of friends. And incidentally, the father-husband in this house was the model for Steve Oblonsky in Anna Karenina. Anyway, so he's sent as a child there. He sees this old man with a long white beard and wearing a smock. And he asks the mother-wife figure there, uh, what is this? And, and she says, well, that's, that's the great writer, uh, Leo Tolstoy. Um, it's all right for a writer to go, a great writer like him, to go around dressed like that. But for ordinary people, it's not suitable. So that, uh, he learned that lesson. Um, he, he participated with Tolstoy in, the, in actually delivering relief in the famine of 1891. And after that, Tolstoy developed the practice of, of calling upon uh, Maklikov to go for walks with him uh, in the city of Moscow. And uh, Maklikov was sufficiently self-conscious about this to ask himself, why does a great writer ask a callow youth like me to do this. And his answer uh, was based on something that uh, Tolstoy had said about the way he moved around at his estate, Yasnia Polyana. He didn't go by horse, or at least typically didn't go by horse uh, or foot. He went by bicycle. And he went by bicycle, Tolstoy explained, because bicycling through the ruts and avoiding stones and so forth kept his mind occupied and prevented him from serious thinking. Serious thinking he wanted to avoid because it would be tiring. Tire is sort of key brain cells. So the urban equivalent of that was to have Maklikov along, diverting him, uh, <laughs> but not challenging his thinking in any serious way. Tolstoy also uh, made referrals to Maklikov uh, of cases involving religious eccentrics, who, as you can understand, quite naturally went to Tolstoy. And uh, these gave Maklikov experience, first place, seeing a side of life that he had had no exposure to. These are uh, almost, in a, a, I mean, I think it's fair to say, a different world from sophisticated urban Moscow. Uh, and also gave experience trying cases to juries in that environment. And he came away, uh, not only it appears, with uh, a great ability to handle juries, but a great respect for them. And I think that played out in his, his view of politics more generally. Um, 
did this relationship have any effect on Maklakov's character? It seems to me one can argue both ways, but I, I would suggest that his finding that you could have a deep relationship, and I think on Maklakov's side, clearly one effectively of love for someone who disagreed fundamentally on issues of political economy, for example. Uh, you could do that, and there was no problem at all, uh, and that that partly accounts for Maklakov being the very gregarious person that he was, and, and during the times of political conflict, talking to people on every side, uh, a very healthy thing. Another, another friend is Alexandra Kolontai, who at the relevant period is sort of migrating from Menshevism to Bolshevism, uh, not exactly uh, Maklakov's ideology, not that at all, um, but uh, a, not merely a close friend, a lover, uh, and um, someone with whom he got along very well, and, and even, I mean, her letters to him show her identifying uh, speeches that he made with which she finds very impressive and so forth. Um, but they were both mavericks in their parties. He uh, did not he did not really belong in the Constitutional Democrats for reasons I may or may not have time to go into, but it, it, he definitely didn't belong there. She didn't really belong with the Bolsheviks. At one point she told an Italian communist, if you hear that I've been arrested for stealing the silverware in the Kremlin, just chalk it up to my disagreeing with Lenin on some issue of rural policy. Which, so she was very realistic about her party. Um, let me turn now to the, um, I, in a way I, I'm, I'm going to try to turn around the approach I took in the book. The approach I took in the book was recounting Maklakov's work in various projects and uh, throughout the period 1905 to 1917, uh, what he did, how he did it, and so forth. Now I'm going to turn that around and view it as a roadmap for the challenges confronting anyone interested in uh, creating or uh, enhancing the rule of law in this period. So at this point, the, it's a more analytical approach than a sort of historical approach. Uh, how do these things fit into the, uh, the development of the rule of law? Uh, I, first, I, I want to say that, that I think if there was ever a time when uh, the rule of law had a chance, had a chance for making progress, this period 1905 to 1917 is it. Uh, the first part of that period uh, you have four Dumas. They're the only period when you have a legislative body in uh, Russia. To be sure, the first two Dumas were very radical. The last two Dumas were very conservative. So it was, uh, that was not necessarily the, um, a program for uh, reform. Neither of them was a program reform because the radicals uh, took on the administration very vehemently, uh, provoking the administration, the, the regime, to be more hostile. Um, but at least it was a period when there was, there was an institution for discussion of Russia's legal problems. So it was a, an opportunity uh, of that sort and a somewhat representative legal institution, the Duma. And in this period, um, the bureaucracy was distinctly divided. There were reformist elements in it uh, and highly reactionary elements in it. The Tsar, I think it's fair to say, was reactionary, but it was also very wobbly, uh, a, a virtue in an extremely reactionary person. So that, um, you know, looking at the, the broad scene, you might say uh, they could have done something useful, uh, but they didn't. Um, and then there's the period of the provisional government where the liberals, in principle, take charge. They are, they are in charge of the provisional government. They have all kinds of, of obstacles, to be sure. <coughs> but if the rule of law is to be supported, uh, that seems like a good uh, opportunity for it. So the, 
What I'm going to do is to divide obstacles to the rule of law into two uh, types, and I'll try to match them up in all cases. Formal institutional defects and informal lacks. The formal institutional defects are, for example, uh, impediments to judicial independence. The informal ones are the social attitudes that underlie, underlie everything. They underlie both the capacity to adopt reforms and the ability, once a reform has been adopted, for it to take root and uh, generate the real sort of protection that we like to see from the rule of law. And so I, I should say that the, uh, of course, the, the purpose of the rule of law, the primary purpose, uh, is to protect people from state arbitrariness. At least I, I think that's, a, that's the definition I will use, so I'll have to accept it for this afternoon. Uh, so I'm going to try to go quickly through these. Yeah. Um, but it, as I say, in each case, I'll match the institutional problem with a sort of social attitude problem. First, let's take judicial independence. Nominally, that had been established in 1864 with protection of judges against being kicked out or demoted or transferred. But the person who was Minister of Justice during most of this period testified later uh, that he had the ability to bend judges to his will, his word, bend. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that he was not understating his powers, and presumably judges got the message. I've never been able to figure out exactly what his techniques were, just as I have to say dealing with uh, current Russian judges, uh, who I think it's fair to say exemplify the same problem, um, how, it, how it is that they tend to succumb to regime pressure. Uh, but there is regime pressure, and it is successfully exerted. Now, what about the relevant social attitudes? In the elite, let's take Tolstoy, perhaps the most, indeed the most extreme example, but still, but not that far off from his fellow highly intellectual colleagues. He took seriously the biblical injunction, judge not that ye be not judged. And taking that view, and also the view that all state exercise of power was illegitimate and equally illegitimate, he wasn't interested in nuances of the difference between an independent court and a submissive court. So he was no friend at all, and the no friend at all on this issue. He was a good friend as a person. Um, and the um, uh, others of the literary elite, uh, although perhaps not as extreme as Tolstoy, shared this sort of in, at least indifference to the kind of protections that uh, Maklakov and anyone interested in the rule of law would be. What about the peasants? Uh, they had a number of aphorisms uh, stating their view of law, one of which, for example, is, if all the laws were removed, people would live justly. Hmm, well, that doesn't seem like uh, a good foundation on which to build a rule of law state. So, um, again, I mean, uh, the, this is a sort of a very strong case, I think, of an institutional defect, a formal institutional defect, and a strong social attitude defect for anyone trying to build the rule of law. Second, remedies for official lawlessness. It's really quite a similar story. There were all kinds of gaps in the system. It's, I, I can't find specific attitudinal or evidence of specific attitudinal differences. But I think it's part of the passivity that people notice in Russians of that era, and perhaps other eras, um, I think can be chalked up to, because it relates to the fact that there aren't remedies. There's nothing you can do. Uh, third, centralization of state authority. I won't go into it, but the, the, again, we turn to Alexander II, and we have a creation of institutions of local self-government, which are valuable and important, but they're, above all, they're subject to discretionary review by the Ministry of Internal Affairs, uh, and so that people in those institutions are accustomed not to making 
local legislative decisions within a framework of law, but making local legislative decisions within a framework of discretionary review from on high. That seems to me quite different as a kind of training for the rule of law. Now, property rights. Uh, one could go on and on about property rights, and of course, perhaps I did in my first book. Uh, but on the, if we're talking about land and pr other property apart from the peasant, uh, what the peasants had, uh, I think it, you know, it was recognized. So that subject to what I said about the lack of independence of judges and about the uh, gaps in remedies against lawless uh, official action, there was protection for property. When you get to the peasant level, uh, I'll simplify quickly to say that until the Stolypin reforms, you have uh, essentially limits on your, your, a, a family's uh, lot size was subject to reduction depending upon the, or possibly increase, depending upon uh, essentially the number of workers in each family on the commune. And the ability to cultivate the land was circumscribed by the need for coordinating with all the other people because of the tiny lot size. And the Stolypin reforms, although I think they're important, barely scratch the surface in that. Um, attitudes, the attitude aspect of property. Contrast the, the West, where private property is generally recognized as a bulwark against uh, against the centralized state. There's no such parallel in Russia. Uh, property, instead of rep representing independence, because it gives the holder a sufficiency, as it were, uh, property there represented an extreme form of dependence because the uh, richest, all, all of the regular landowners who had serfs, at least until 1861, uh, were highly dependent on the czar for keeping the serfs in their place. So it symbolized dependence, not independence, and it symbolized dependence of a particularly oppressive kind, dependence enabling the dependent people uh, the better to oppress their serfs. Then the peasants, uh, I think only, only a word needs to be said about their view of property. They had been property until 1861. That is not a very good background for having a high respect for it. Um, I want to, I'm going to flip through a number of things quite quickly. Um, let me, I'll, I'll, resume my regular notes on this issue. The, the direct government uh, efforts to prevent private associations. Um, you know, the, the biblical or the saying of Jesus, whenever two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there. I think one can impute to the czarist regime a, a parallel but radically different uh, slogan. Whenever two or three are gathered together, and my minions are not there, they're probably up to no good. And, and therefore, it's a good idea to prohibit private associations. Maklikoff encountered this at a fairly early stage because, the, as I said, the uh, student orchestra funds were to be allocated to peasant relief. Well, how is that to be administered? The, uh, the watchful eye of the state kept an eye on how that was to happen so that uh, Maklikoff and the other students couldn't just use their own entity. Uh, it had to be something uh, approved by the state. And actually, they worked out a compromise that made it look as if uh, the students were not being subservient to the government, but in fact, they sort of were. Um, Maklikoff was active on, on all these issues, including the ones that I've, I've omitted because of time. Um, but the, the, um, the upshot was something where it seems to me is beautifully summarized by Tocqueville in a description of pre-revolutionary France. 
When the revolution happened, one would have to search most of France in vain for 10 men who had the habit of acting in common in an orderly way and taking care of their own defense themselves. Only the central power was supposed to take care of it. And I would argue that Russia had created a similar, the Russian regime had created a similar situation. Um, I, I want to turn to, um, yeah, I think I should turn at this point, but I welcome questions later. I want to turn to this debate between uh, Kerensky and Maklakov. The, the issue is turning into a statute, a decree enacted in October 1906, which released various uh, bonds on the peasant estate. And as Maklakov said in introducing the measure, he was the reporter for the committee which was in charge of it. It was, it was a bill initially supported by the government, incidentally, not a, some sign of actual reformers at work in the government. Um, he acknowledged that, in the first place, the, the bill itself, the, the decree of 1906 was itself limited. The bill which he was offering was somewhat limited in, in the sense that it did not make radical changes with the uh, 1906 decree. And he had a, a very clearly stated reason for that. If they, he believed that if they stuck within the sort of general parameters of the bill, uh, essentially removing restrictions on the peasant estate, uh, it, would, it would probably get approval of the state council and would become a, a true statute. There were others who wanted to take the occasion to remove restrictions, uh, similarly uh, arbitrary restrictions, on Jews. And Maklakov would have been delighted to do that, but he said and argued uh, very firmly uh, that uh, this would defeat the whole project. So anyway, Kerensky basically acknowledges that the decree of 1906 was good, that the bill extending it, even if only modestly, was good. Uh, but he wanted, he wanted to do two things. He wanted to trash Stolypin, who was the creator of the 1906 decree, and by extension, uh, since Maklakov was promoting uh, essentially a decree of Stolypin, by innuendo, he trashed Maklakov. And Ma Maklakov responded to this uh, with great moderation and discretion. And I just want to read to you what he says in response to the accusation uh, that he's being some way soft on Stolypin. For me, to recognize when my opponent is right, that was Stolypin, uh, to recognize the deserts of my political foe is a duty of political honor, and I have here fulfilled it. And that seemed to me very nicely put paid to the Kerensky uh, attack on Maklakov. There are other things I can go into on that, but um, I think I should stop. So um, I'd be delighted to have questions. Thank you for that. Eric? <laughs> um, so you had legal training. Revolutionary movements of 1905 and 1917, and just more generally, his theory of law and the rule of law. How did he come to reconcile that with those revolutionary moments? And uh, I mean, there were debates in, among legal jurists about uh, principles of natural law versus positive law, and whether the revolution was compatible with that, and whether I mean, there were other thinkers in the cadets who said, "Well, we promote rule of law, but revolution." Can Part of that, if we embrace principles of natural right and, and, and there, thereby impose natural right into the legal system and, and thereby uh, reconcile all of these things, did he have uh, sort of a, a well, philosophy yeah, of uh, uh, it, natural right? If, if I can, I'll, I'll, I'll try to try to take a two-track approach to that. Yeah. One is part of what you're saying sounds in very high legal theory, mm -hmm. and on the whole, I would say that Maklakov 
tended to avoid that. Now, one area where perhaps you would say he didn't was on the question of coups d'etat, coup d'etats, whatever the plural is, uh, where his position was a quite practical one. That is to say, how does it all work out? He acknowledges that they're illegal when they happen, but sometimes, and he points, for example, to the coming to power of Catherine the Great, uh, they work out well and they become accepted by the society and that's it, you just gotta move on. Uh, he did not think that that was true of the coup of, November, of, of June 3, 1907, the coup by which the Tsar changed the uh, franchise for the election of the Duma. That's why we go from the radical first two Dumas to the conservative uh, third and fourth Dumas. Uh, so he, he did not accept that as, as, a, as a coup that got legitimized. Then as to the, I think it's fair to say that in the uh, truly, re well, in the February Revolution, where the Tsarist regime, where the Tsar, where Tsar Nicholas was compelled effectively to abdicate, he pretty strongly believed that the liberals taking power should do everything they could to make his brother Michael uh, the czar, which was actually what uh, Nicholas tried to bring about, while all the others except for Milyukov tried to discourage that, I think because they felt it would get in the way of their exercise of power and also, I think they had no sense, and this, this goes back to the sort of cultural attitude toward institutions, they had no sense of the advantage of having a framework for reaching decisions. The, the Duma had a very narrow franchise starting in, in June 1907. So the, the Duma that was around in February 1917 was in certain respects illegitimate and unrepresentative. There were actually ways in which that could have been changed because there was, was a practice in other institutions of bringing back into the current institution former members of the institution. So that the Duma, the fourth Duma, could have added back in people from the first, second, and third and thus made it a more representative uh, institution. As far as I can make out, uh, the liberals spent no time at all thinking about this option. And, and, and I can only attribute it to a, an, a, an indifference to sort of institutional continuation and normalcy and balance of powers. In fact, somewhere in my notes, I have a favorite quotation of mine, which is Maklakoff quoting the poet Nekrasov, it isn't easy to correct the work of centuries. And I think the, the liberals, saving Maklakoff and a few others, had uh, very little sense of that. Yes? Oh, the the Russian printing. Yes. I find that very difficult. But the but the print the <laughs> the uh, happily um, the Russian printing that I was looking at was almost always in the twentieth century, and overwhelmingly in the Duma records, which are really pretty clear. And uh, I can't remember whether they had to what extent the typography is a little. It certainly it's slightly different from current topography, uh, but not radically. Um, so that, that that was not a serious problem, which is not to say that I was able to read it easily or fluently, but it, I was able to work through it. As for the handwriting of Russians, uh, I'm completely at sea in that. Uh, I was told in an early stage of this venture that Maklakoff's handwriting was absolutely indecipherable. That's by people who read Russian handwriting all the time. 
So I never even tried. Uh, and in fact, I didn't come across um, letters out from him, uh, which would have been helpful anyway. There's a great cache of letters into him. Um, some of them Alexandra Kolontai, uh, uh, some of them also from a, another girlfriend of his, uh, which gives an interesting picture of his, his life, including his romantic life. Yeah, Derek. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> so what was his relationship with the Tobrists like? Um, I've been reading recently about an attempt by the Trubetskoy brothers to create a par party of peaceful renewal between the cadets and the Tobrists. And as far as I can tell, they got basically themselves and a couple of cousins to join, but nobody else. Yeah, uh, but I, mean, I mean, that's a really good question. Was he actively trying to maybe create some sort of coalition of right he was. He, 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 he was. he was a great believer in coalitions, mm -hmm. and the chapter on national liberals talks a lot about that. Um, there was extraordinary stubbornness. I mean, he had been a, a constitutional Democrat from its founding Congress. Um, he, he was active in that founding Congress, uh, but he was at odds with them on a number of very important issues, most important being actually the question of peasant property. Uh, but the other th thing is that in uh, particularly in the third Duma and the fourth Duma, the uh, Constitutional Democrats were very reluctant to form alliances with other parties, and particularly Milyukov uh, had the idea, which I find slightly crazy, that <laughs> the, 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 the three keys, the three important things to address were the scope of the franchise, removal of the state council as a coordinate part of the legislature, and establishment of a rule that the government must be responsible to the Duma. And so, call them the three locks, and seem to believe that until they could be unlocked, uh, no progress could be made. And it's, there's an interesting sort of uh, a debate in the cadet party where they go from a kind of extreme formulation by Milyukov, uh, which seems to make cooperation with other parties uh, a very low order of priority, to a slight change as ba on the basis of people like Maklikov seeking more compromise and, and more affiliation with other parties. Uh, but the change in the language is minuscule, I have to say. So the, the obduracy of the cadet party, and, the, and particularly of Milyukov, uh, was extreme. I, on that, I sh should add something. In 1917, the era of the provisional government, the question of agricultural reform is again before them. Maklikov comes up with a proposal which uh, would not involve any sort of upsetting of the then prevailing property regime, but it would favor smallholders by making, by providing differential tax rates, higher taxes on the larger tracts. So uh, since the, the principal concern of the cadets was distributional, favoring the poor peasants at the expense of large landholders, it seemed to fit their purposes quite well. They wouldn't listen, well, they listened to him. He gave a speech, and they said almost by acclamation, well, that's not our policy. There's no point in us discussing that. They, they did not uh, attack it on the merits. They just said, this isn't the way we view things. And, and it's true, I mean, they had been arguing for something much more drastic for, uh, more than a decade, and they weren't about to listen to proposals which would accomplish a great deal of what they really wanted uh, without the disruptive effects, which were in the middle of World War I, uh, would have had very serious consequences. And so I wanted to say another thing about um, institutional continuation. Although addressing 
the war would have been very difficult under any circumstances because there basically was a great social divide in Russia on that. Uh, I do think that a legislative body expanded, as I've suggested, to be more liberal than the Fourth Duma was, uh, would have provided a, a forum for debating that, uh, which might have led to an agreed-on policy. I mean, in, in the end, it went by default to Lenin, who had, an, had a policy, uh, which in the end, if, if it was not a majority that agreed on it, at least those who disagreed were ineffective in taking any other, in bringing about any other view. And in many respects, it seems to me one could say Lenin was right, uh, but it uh, would have been far better, I think, and possibly achievable to arrive at a conclusion, whatever it was, by, by debate among interested parties uh, rather than by, uh, as happened in October, uh, a coup d'etat, although one of the easier coup d'etats that ever happened. Yes? Were there foreign thinkers or constitutions that engaged him in some way? That's interesting. I, I, that's a wonderful question because um, there's, there's one event that uh, inspired great ridicule on his part. There was a conference between Milyukov and Count Vita in uh, late 1905 when things are, are shakiest. And Milyukov says, what the Tsar should do is promulgate a constitution he should take either the Belgian or the Bulgarian constitution, translate it, and promulgate it as Russia's constitution without any thought of slight differences that might exist between, uh, first place, a vast empire, and second place, um, a, a country encrusted with, uh, I don't know want to use the term backward, but with social expectations radically different from those which underlie a constitutional regime. So, and uh, uh, Maklikov has great fun with that. Um, I think it's fair to say he, I, he might be criticized for not paying enough attention to foreign possibilities. He was an admirer of the British Constitution for reasons that I think you can see that fit into his notions of gradualism and uh, well, certainly, certainly gradualism. Uh, he never mentions the American founding. In fact, he speaks quite scoffingly of the idea of people getting together in a room and concocting a constitution. I mean, I happen to think they did an awfully good job. And maybe that's because I'm paid to enforce it. But anyway, um, he, um, he never seriously addressed that. And, and Switching to, to his side, I think uh, he, he was probably right to think that the Constituent Assembly, which was in fact elected, of course, at the end of 1917, it's hard to say what they would have done if the Bolsheviks had let them try uh, in creating a constitution, because the kind of deficits in uh, social thought that I've tried to outline would have been a very serious obstacle to making headway on that. Yes? I think you started by saying something about you wanted to show how someone could stand up to a party or uh, to a bully. I forget how you put it. Oh, in. yes. But how, what would your conclusion be? Oh, no, that, that was... That was the episode that I reported, although there are other aspects of that debate in terms of the Maklikov kerensky uh, challenge in 1916. Uh, but let me, let me tell you more about Kerensky's bullying. Do, do For, speak into the, oh. the microphone. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. Let me tell you more about Kerensky's bullying technique. First place, uh, there was constant misrepresentation of what Maklikov had said. And it just goes on and on and on. Second place, there was this innuendo that since this decree came from Stolypin, 
And Maklakoff is working within the framework of trying to improve that decree as well as turning it into a statute. Maklakoff is therefore in some way tainted with all the sins that the liberals generally attributed to Stolypin. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think the, uh, I find it uh, uh, dishonest, bullying in the sense of going charging on and on, even in the face of mild correction by Maklakoff, uh, and uh, not, a, not a way in which people who are seriously wishing to advance the argument uh, would debate. But Maklakoff really never picks up, never responds by mirroring those techniques. Quite the opposite, he responds possibly by even b being more inclined to a sort of cool analytical view and a, a non-accusatory view uh, than he normally is. Although he's, those are attributes of his debating style all the time, so, um, so maybe it's not that much different, but he's not, he's not blown into echoing the misbehavior by my lights, and I think definitely his lights, uh, of Kerensky. I have to say that I, I, I'm probably the only person uh, in the field of Russian history who's read that debate. <laughs> and I feel it gave me to a, an exposure to Kerensky uh, that I would never want to have again, uh, and that, that gives me a perspective on Kerensky that uh, scholars of the period would all benefit from. I tried to share that in the book. Uh, the book actually goes on. There's, there's a chapter called Exile. So we have actually 40 years covered in less than 20 pages. And he was named ambassador to France by the provisional government. Uh, in October, he heads off to France. But before he can present his credentials at the Quai d'Orsay, the provisional government has fallen and the Bolsheviks are in charge. So he's left there. Um, without credentials, essentially, or without working credentials. Now, the, France didn't recognize the Bolshe Bolshevik regime until 1924, so there's a seven-year gap during which uh, Maklakov essentially occupied the uh, Russian embassy uh, in Paris uh, and carried on responsibilities as best he could. Uh, the, the responsibilities fell into a variety of, of forms in the in the very first period, he was trying to make sure that some Russian voice was heard at the Paris Peace Conference. And, and I think he did as well as one could, but the people at the Paris Peace Conference were just not that interested in what defrocked Russians, as it were, might have to say. They, they also weren't interested in what the Bolsheviks had to say because they were very doubtful whether the Bolsheviks would survive. Um, so that was, that was one project where I think he tried as well as he possibly could. The other, the other great activity really <coughs> was being a, a Russian voice in Paris, a, a, a channel between the emigre community and the uh, French government. And I should say the French government, to its credit, actually created an office to which it appointed him to be this representative from, from the Russians to themselves. And, and he had to do such things as um, try, when the, a, uh, uh, let's see, there was a, there was a I'm trying to remember, there were, there were two assassinations. Uh, and one, one was by a, um, I think it's a, a, a Pole uh, in Poland. And he's, he's arrested and uh, is sent to a military tribunal 
when the Russians hear that, Russians in Paris hear that, they think, ugh, that's the end for this poor guy. And it, 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 the, the assassination was one they were generally uh, sympathetic to. So they, were, they were, did not like the idea of this person getting uh, a quick brush off uh, at a military trial. In fact, it turned out that the uh, Poles had selected this means because they could control it. Not, not a model of the rule of law, perhaps. They could, they could control it and make sure that nothing drastic happened to this guy. And, and actually, Maklikov, through an intermediary, learned what what was up and was able to pacify the Russians. So he, he was doing that sort of thing. And the other, the other thing he had to do a great deal was to uh, help Russians get their papers out of the, uh, out of the, Russia, out of the French bureaucracy. And uh, as I point out in the book, Maklikov is recognized in a novel published in France in, I think, 2015 uh, as someone who has uh, helped one of the characters in the novel uh, get admission to France. And so his, his, uh, he casts a shadow going forward about 100 years. So. Thank you. Oops. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.